Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight in conversation with Mr. Palashenko. My name is Jonathan Bogan, and I'm an ambassador for the Dartmouth Political Union. I would first like to thank the entire political, Dartmouth Political Union executive team for all the hard work that men, went into making this event possible. For those who have not been to a DPU event previously, we are a nonpartisan organization committed to issue-based conversations from all political perspectives. We aim to create an understanding environment of free thought on our campus. We host a diverse group of speakers to unpack the most pressing national issues. We also host regular social events and student debates for our members. Our speaker tonight is Pavel Poloshenko, who I have had the honor and pleasure of meeting along with President Gorbachev several years ago in Moscow. Mr. Poloshenko was Gorbachev's chief interpreter from 1985 to 1991, helping translate all of the Soviet American summits, including the historical Reykjavik summit, in which it was declared that nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Before working with Gorbachev, he worked with the Simultaneous Interpretation Service at the United Nations in New York from 1974 to 1979, and as a translator and interpreter in the Soviet Foreign Ministry and the USA Affairs Department, working on arms control and arms reduction. Mr. Poloshenko received his education from the leading Soviet foreign languages school, now called Moscow State Linguistic University. He left government service in 1992 to remain with Gorbachev at the think tank he set up after his resignation, the Gorbachev Foundation. Since then, he has participated in numerous conferences on international security, arms control, and published books and articles in Russian and international media. While the DPU is extremely excited to hear Mr. Poloshenko's thoughts, any views expressed by our speaker are not endorsed by myself or the Dartmouth Political Union. Our moderator for tonight's event, History Department Professor Stefan Link specializes in the history of global political economy, business history, and the intellectual history of capitalism. Thank you to Professor Link for joining us this evening. The event tonight will consist of 10 to 15 minutes of introductory remarks from Mr. Poloshenko, a 25 minute moderator guided Q&A led by Professor Link, and 20 minutes of audience Q&A. We will be taking live questions during the latter part of this event. So if you would like to ask a question to Mr. Palashenko, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And remember to upvote your favorite questions. If you're not comfortable asking your question live, please submit it anonymously. And with that, I will hand it over to Mr. Palashenko for his introductory remarks. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. It's good to recall uh, your visit to uh, Moscow. Indeed, uh, that's when we met when you came to Moscow with your dad and uh, mother, and uh, I was able to arrange a meeting for you with President Gorbachev. Unfortunately, his health uh, declined, uh, uh, and um, he was in very frail condition uh, during the final years of his life. Uh, those were very difficult years. He uh, died at age 91. Uh, it's a long life, uh, and of course, the highlight. The highlights of his uh, life are the years 1985 to 1991, when he was the leader of the Soviet Union. He was elected the general secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union uh, in March 1985. At that time, that was uh, the uh, top position in the Soviet hierarchy. Nominally, there was a head of state. Uh, but, of course, all the main decisions were taken by the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party, by the Politburo of that Central Committee. So they elected Gorbachev, a person who was significantly younger than his predecessors. I mean, those predecessors, Leonid Brezhnev, Yuri Andropov, and uh, uh, Konstantin Chernenko, all of them died in office at an age that doesn't seem really very old to me today because I'm 73 years old myself now, and they died in their 70s. So they uh, were in very frail health at that time, and people were waiting for someone younger, for someone more energetic, for someone who would breathe new life into the Soviet society. And everyone basically expected into the Soviet system. When Gorbachev came to power, the idea of a revolutionary change in the Soviet system, of 
replacing that system with a totally new one, that idea was not on the mind of many people, and it was certainly not on the mind of the members of the Politburo and of the Communist Party Central Committee who elected uh, Gorbachev. At that time, the idea was to improve that system. And uh, perestroika, the process of change initiated by Gorbachev during the first couple of years, basically was aimed at changes that would be within the framework of that old system. So one can say today that those years were wasted, but that, that is not exactly the case, because at that time, the process of glasnost, and that is openness, freedom of speech, transparency, accountability of government, was also launched. And so even though there was no significant transformation of the Soviet economic and political system, there was freedom in the air, and people were free to discuss the problems and the process of change as it was developing. And so fairly soon it became clear, it became clear because of Glasnost, because of freedom of speech, that the attempts to change the system by basically working within it were not working. And that, for example, the economic hierarchy, the Council of Ministers, with its panoply of various ministries responsible for government ministries, responsible for every sector of the economy, for every industry, for even small things that in a normal society are decided by market economics and by the interaction of free economic actors. All of that was basically something for which the government was responsible, and it wasn't working, but at the same time, the government, the council of ministers, were slowing, were putting a break on the uh, attempts to reform that economic system. And so Gorbachev and his closest associate came to the conclusion that a political reform was necessary, that without a political reform, which would allow the people to join in the process of change, economic reform would simply not work. Well, one might argue that, for example, in China, they were able to launch a process of economic reform, successful economic reform, without changing the political system. But that's the difference between China and the Soviet Union in 1985. Those were two different countries with a, a totally different context, with different, uh, with different nations, with different history. Um, I have no time to go into it, but basically I do believe that the decision to launch a political reform was the right one and that it did make possible economic reforms. Unfortunately, uh, successful economic reforms did not happen within the limited time that Gorbachev had available. Anyway, uh, without going too deeply into the domestic uh, changes and the difficult uh, process of changing the Soviet political and economic system, I will now go to the uh, international scene and uh, will try to explain what Gorbachev had in mind when he initiated a process of ending the Cold War and ending the nuclear arms race that was jeopardizing the survival of humankind. So the Soviet ideology was quite dogmatic, and that hampered economic changes and, of course, also political changes. But there was one thing in the Soviet ideology and the philosophy of uh, Marxism Leninism as interpreted by the Soviet leaders after the death of Stalin that Gorbachev took advantage of, and that is the idea of peaceful coexistence. Peaceful coexistence was the idea that 
different political and economic systems, countries with different and economic and political systems, can work together, that the Cold War was not inevitable, and in particular, the real war, the hot war, was not inevitable. And that was the first thing that Gorbachev repeated, but at the same time also developed further in his first speeches on international affairs. He went beyond peaceful coexistence. He went beyond the so-called detente, which basically meant the easing of tensions between the Soviet Union and the West, in particular the United States. He said that we should not just normalize our relations, but we should radically reduce nuclear weapons. That was the centerpiece of his so-called new political thinking. And based on that, based on cooperation in reducing weapons, in reducing in particular nuclear arms, we could gradually move toward not just normal, more normal relations between uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S., but ultimately toward cooperation and toward partnership. So as Gorbachev's ideas evolved, he outlined those ideas in some detail uh, to the United Nations in 1988. Uh, that was December 1988. I participated in that visit. Uh, the visit happened after the presidential elections in the U.S., uh, when after two presidential terms of Ronald Reagan, his vice president, George H.W. Bush, was elected the president of the United States. So Gorbachev met on Governor's Island um, with both uh, presidents, the, the president and the president-elect. Uh, that was a very important moment. It kind of summarized the results of the work that had been done by that time by Gorbachev and Reagan. Gorbachev and Reagan were two men who couldn't be more different in terms of their background, their biography, their political views. And that showed in Geneva when they first met in 1985, in November 1985. But at the same time, there was one thing that brought them together, and uh, that is their revulsion of nuclear war, their rejection of nuclear war and nuclear weapons. The phrase contained in their first joint statement that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought really reflected the deep convictions of those two men. And that is what made it possible in Reykjavik, just one, less than one year later after Geneva, less than one year after Geneva, to formulate the parameters of agreements, future agreements on nuclear weapons, on reducing and limiting nuclear weapons. They agreed to eliminate medium range missiles deployed by both the Soviet Union and the United States in uh, Europe, in the European part of the Soviet Union and in several European countries by the United States. The Soviet Union, unfortunately, was the first to deploy those weapons. The United States responded, so Gorbachev and Reagan agreed in Reykjavik that those missiles must be eliminated altogether. And they also agreed that the next strategic arms agreement, the agreement on intercontinental ballistic missiles, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and strategic bombers, should call for a 50% reduction of those weapons. Of course, it's easier to outline the principal parameters than to agree on all the details. And it did take some time. But so far as medium range missiles are concerned, the treaty was signed just one year after Reykjavik. It took just one year to develop a treaty that contained hundreds of pages of parameters, protocols, uh, inspection memorandums, et cetera, 
All of that took time, but actually a little more than one year. Uh, today, it looks like uh, a world record in terms of the time necessary for arms control agreements. Unfortunately, the strategic arms uh, agreement start one strategic arms reduction treaty. The first strategic arms reduction treaty took more time. That's unfortunate. But nevertheless, again, it wasn't that much time because in uh, August, in, uh, yeah, I think it was August the 1st, 1991, Gorbachev and President Bush signed that agreement that called for 50% reduction in nuclear weapons. Um, that was uh, a process uh, that launched the process that by now has resulted in the elimination of about 90% of the weapons that were deployed at the peak of the Cold War. That's an amazing achievement, 90%. Both countries still have too many nuclear weapons. Even if we take just the strategic nuclear weapons, the long-range nuclear weapons, it is still a lot. It is uh, more than 700 launches, launchers uh, for each side and uh, more than 15 100 nuclear warheads deployed on those launchers. But nevertheless, that's just 10% of what was deployed at the height of the Cold War. It's an amazing achievement, and it was started by those two agreements signed by uh, President Gorbachev and President Reagan, and then by President uh, Reagan, by President Gorbachev and President George Bush. So I would say that uh, probably, uh, historically, if we look at it in retrospect, that was probably the main achievement because it ended the nuclear arms race and it ended the uh, Cold War. It was, I think, two events that marked symbolically the end of the Cold War. The first event, and I actually was standing right beside President Ronald Reagan, when he said that, was uh, in the Kremlin when Gorbachev and Reagan took a walk first on Red Square, and then they re-entered the Kremlin. And in the Kremlin, there is an old cannon called the Tsar Cannon, going back to the 17th century. Actually, Gorbachev made the point to Reagan that that cannon was never used as a military weapon. But anyway, a group of American and the Soviet reporters gathered near that cannon and wanted to ask a few questions. And the question that they put, one of them, the American reporter, put to President Reagan was, Mr. President, do you still believe that the Soviet Union is an evil empire? Well, indeed, President Reagan hinted, suggested in one of his speeches he never mentioned, by the way, the Soviet Union by name, but in one of his speeches in 1982, he said, we all know that there is an evil empire, and we all know that it has plans to destroy us, to destroy our freedoms, to destroy our system. And of course, everyone understood that he meant the Soviet Union. So he was asked, whether he still believed that the Soviet Union was an evil empire. And his answer was no. It was another time, another era. The Soviet Union is changing under General Secretary Gorbachev. It is changing in a direction that will make cooperation between our countries possible. So that was the first part of the symbolic end of the Cold War. And the second part was in Malta in December 1989, when President Gorbachev and President Bush met for their first summit, where they shook hands and agreed that the two nations no longer regard each other as enemies. That is something that was said in Malta, and that is something that became the basis of relations between the new Soviet Union, a Soviet Union that was changing, and the United States.
and the West. Well, <clears throat> we all know that for reasons mostly that were of internal domestic nature, the republics of the Soviet Union decided to break up and to go their own way. So the place in the UN Security Council, the seat in the UN Security Council, the permanent membership in the UN Security Council that had been occupied by the Soviet Union was now taken by Russia as a successor to the Soviet Union. After the republics decided to break up, Gorbachev resigned. President Yeltsin mostly continued Gorbachev's foreign policy, particularly during his first years in power. And the process of arms reduction and arms control continued quite successfully, even though not at the same pace as when Gorbachev and Bush signed the first START agreement. That was a 50% reduction. A reduction, subsequent reductions were more modest. But I do think that the legacy of those arms control agreements, even though first the United States and then uh, Russia withdrew from uh, the ABM treaty, the treaty uh, on ballistic missile defenses, and then under President Trump, the United States withdrew from the uh, agreement to eliminate intermediate, medium range nuclear weapons. <clears throat> Nevertheless, I do believe that even in the current difficult and, and even tragic times, the legacy of <clears throat> Mikhail Gorbachev, particularly in arms reduction and arms control, does survive. We have not seen a a new arms race of the same proportions that the world saw in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, the START treaty is still observed by both sides. There are some issues that I understand will be discussed um, in a few days when the delegations of Russia and the US will meet on neutral ground. So arms control and arms reduction is just the, the only pillar that now exists in relations between our countries that are otherwise in a dismal state. And I believe that the survival of uh, arms reduction, the survival of the process of limiting and ultimately eliminating nuclear weapons, which was the dream of both President Reagan and President Bush, I do believe that that is the most important legacy of Mikhail Gorbachev. And I, I do hope that the process will resume and that if it does resume and if it scores additional successes, more agreements on reducing and limiting nuclear weapons. And I do believe that the uh, arms control legacy of uh, Gorbachev and uh, Reagan uh, still survives. And I do hope that the process will resume and that if it is successful, it could uh, form the basis for further normalization of relations between our two nations. And I think that's, that's probably the most important point that I wanted to make. Okay, well, here we are. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Balaschenko. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here with you. and. I would uh, like to thank you on behalf of the Dartmouth community uh, for uh, coming to uh, join us today and uh, speaking to us despite the technical difficulties. Um, and also thank you for your opening statements, which I think made a very powerful case about uh, nuclear disarmament and ending the Cold War as being uh, the main legacy of uh, Gorbachev and uh, Perestroika, a legacy which you suggested uh, still uh, survives and uh, should, might or should serve as an inspiration uh, for, um, uh, for a development uh, today. And I want to ask you more about uh, Perestroika and Gorbachev's legacy, obviously. But before I do that, uh, I just was wondering if you could uh, tell us uh, about how you got to be such a close collaborator to uh, Mikhail Gorbachev in the first place. So uh, maybe you can tell us, when did you first meet 
uh, Gorbachev, and how did your relationship to him develop over the years? Uh, well, I first met him when I was asked to, I was working at that time in the translation department of the Soviet foreign ministry, and I was asked to interpret uh, his interview uh, uh, for an Indian uh, newspaper. There was an Indian reporter in the Kremlin, and that was when I first uh, actually entered the uh, Kremlin and uh, Gorbachev's office. Uh, he invited the reporter to uh, ask some uh, questions. There were some questions that had been <clears throat> submitted in advance, uh, but Gorbachev wanted also to talk to him uh, in addition to the written replies that uh, he provided. And so it took about an hour. There was a uh, conversation that did not break particularly new ground. The interview was part of the preparations for the visit of the Indian Prime Minister, Rajiv Gandhi, to Moscow. Uh, so I would say that no particularly new ground was broken, but it was very lively. And uh, I, uh, of course, couldn't but notice the big difference between the frail and uh, uh, physically weak uh, predecessors of Mikhail Gorbachev and Gorbachev, very energetic, uh, very lively, uh, uh, very quick with his um, uh, answers. And uh, apparently it worked uh, for me and it worked for him because uh, then I was asked to uh, be an interpreter during the entire visit of Rajiv Gandhi. And then I was also uh, in the team of uh, uh, Soviet interpreters uh, during the first summit in Geneva uh, in November 1985. So basically, part of it is is chance. Part of it is just that uh, I happened uh, to be in the right place, and the first uh, attempt to interpret at, at this highest level, at the summit level, worked well. And um, apparently this was noticed by uh, people. Uh, uh, Gorbachev did not speak English, so he could not actually evaluate my interpretation. But it was apparently noticed by other people. And uh, gradually, I became, uh, in, in, I would say, between Geneva and Reykjavik, I became uh, the number one interpreter in the Soviet team. You should know that, of course, I was not the only one. Uh, every official visit, uh, like a summit visit to the United States, uh, requires a, a whole team of interpreters working with various officials, uh, working not only uh, to interpret, to translate during the negotiations, but also uh, during the various events like official dinners, press conferences, etc. So I was not the only one. But yes, indeed, it, it, it so happened that I was with uh, Gorbachev as his principal interpreter uh, during all the summits uh, that he had with American leaders and also the summits with uh, Mrs. Thatcher, Rajiv Gandhi, and others. So that's how it happened. Uh, excellent. I mean, you were in that role present at uh, some of the most consequential uh, conversations in world affairs of the 1980s and 90s. Uh, and I, I imagine that your role as interpreter um, could maybe at moments have been quite delicate. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering, and I'm sure uh, maybe listeners in the audience here are wondering uh, too, if you were ever nervous about your responsibilities or you know, maybe worried that a slight mistranslation or maybe just getting the tone of a remark not exactly right at the first go, that this would derail things or maybe have unintended consequences? Uh, well, one really cannot afford to be nervous uh, when one works at this uh, level. It's, it's really something that has to be like, you know, uh, taken out of the equation, I would say. And I would say that about not just myself, but also my American colleagues. I am very friendly still with um, the uh, principal 
interpreter for President uh, Reagan and the uh, publisher of Dmitry Zarechnik, uh, uh, who was my counterpart on the U.S. side. And uh, he, too, is the same. I mean, you can't afford to be nervous. You have to take it totally out of the picture. And this is what we did. I want to turn to uh, Perestroika and Gorbachev's uh, legacy. Now, you talked about uh, the international part of Perestroika, and it's fair to say that, especially in the West, this is obviously generally seen as successful and historically transformative, uh, together with Western leaders, Gorbachev with Perestroika, ended the Cold War, uh, he ended Soviet control over Eastern Europe. Uh, he withdrew troops from Afghanistan. He made um, German reunification uh, possible. Um, and you talked about nuclear disarmament in particular, but now perestroika, and uh, this is the way you began your remarks, is obviously not, it was obviously not only a foreign policy, but a Soviet domestic project, uh, which included uh, political and economic elements, so democratization and the introduction of civil liberties at home, often associated with the term glasnost and market-oriented economic reform. Now here, the record uh, is, often, um, is often commented on as much more um, mixed. Uh, so one could point to uh, that in the wake of perestroika, uh, for example, in the 1990s, one could point to the enormous economic catastrophe uh, when after uh, radical liberal liberalization uh, and uh, after the radical market liberalization, uh, Russian GDP, real GDP uh, collapsed almost by half. Or um, others have pointed to obviously the limited reach of democracy and civil liberties in Russia today. So how did Gorbachev see, and in retrospect, and how do you see the political and economic legacy of perestroika within Russia? Uh, well, uh, I, I think I said in my remarks that uh, the Soviet system, economic and political uh, system, was particularly difficult to reform compared even to other so-called socialist uh, countries like uh, China or Hungary or Poland, all of those countries had their problems. And uh, the reforms, let's say, in, in China were not always smooth sailing. And uh, they, they are experiencing economic difficulties now. And the same can be said about countries like Poland and, and Hungary. But the problems that the Soviet economy faced, uh, I mean, are way, were way greater than the problems of probably any other country that called itself socialist. Uh, the, the Soviet economic system was based on a very dogmatic interpretation of Marxism. For example, it basically banished private property. It basically banished the role of money, there was money, of course, but it basically banished the role of money as something that uh, is a kind of blood system of the economy. Uh, it centralized everything and it sub subjected all economic activity to decisions taken in the center to decisions taken in Moscow by an organization called GOSPLAN, the State Planning Commission. There was the same thing actually happened in other countries that called themselves socialists, but not to that same extent. There was, for example, private agriculture in Poland. There was some private property in um, Hungary. If you take China, their economy was so underdeveloped that practically anything, like for example, giving the peasants the right to work their plots of land and sell their produce in the open market, immediately resulted in significant economic changes and improvements in the standard of living. In the Soviet Union, everything was a lot more complicated. And there was, as I said, the centralized government economic bureaucracy 
that hampered, hindered any attempt to change that system. So when we accept, recognize that Gorbachev's uh, efforts in terms of changing the economy were less than successful, we have to bear in mind the kind of problems and the magnitude of problems that he had to face. Now, of course, people in Russia in particular, in Russia, not in the other republics, but in Russia, people blamed Gorbachev and many still blame Gorbachev for the breakup of the Soviet Union. And they say that it is in this that he was particularly unsuccessful and they hold him responsible. But again, you have to remember that the Soviet Union was a very special country. It was a country where within one nation, there were republics, nations as different as Estonia, uh, a northern, uh, almost Scandinavian nation with a Protestant tradition, and Turkmenistan a backward uh, country where, you know, uh, which was, of course, of, of Muslim heritage, but, but it's not even about Muslim heritage. It, it's, it's, it's about the very traditional society that couldn't be more different from the mostly European societies of Russia and uh, republics like Estonia and Latvia. So how do you keep that country together? People are blaming Gorbachev, but they didn't have an answer to how to keep that country together for the mutual benefit of all of those republics. Gorbachev believed that the union of those republics had to be reinvented politically, giving them a lot more sovereignty, a lot more autonomy, but at the same time making it possible for them to work for mutual benefit. Most of those republics, particularly the Baltic states, wanted more. They wanted independence. So Gorbachev's attempt was to negotiate with those republics when Ukraine demanded independence. Again, Gorbachev said, okay, but let's negotiate about how we live together. And, and, and that failed after the attempted coup against Gorbachev, which weakened Gorbachev's position and after that, the republics of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus decided that they wanted a divorce. But Gorbachev still uh, wanted to, to save some kind of a union, but only using political means. He absolutely rejected any attempt to hold them together by force. And so in a way, that was a model, an example, which unfortunately wasn't followed subsequently. But in a way, that too was a great achievement, that, that he renounced the use of force and uh, decided to work for some kind of a union politically rather than by using force. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's excellent. I mean, it is easy to forget and is often forgotten that uh, Gorbachev did not set out to dismantle the Soviet Union. He wanted to reform the Soviet Union. In fact, uh, I think it is fair to say that he felt that reform was mandatory and that it would strengthen the Soviet Union and make it uh, more um, a more competitive uh, participant politically and economically on the world stage. Yet, at the end uh, of the day, uh, the uh, Soviet Union disintegrated for reasons that you mentioned. But uh, since you brought up uh, Ukraine, um, I want to ask you, you, you have said recently that before uh, his death, Gorbachev uh, was, in your words, shocked and bewildered by uh, how events unfolded between Russia and Ukraine, not only over the last year, but also in the years previously. Now, what was the source of his dismay? Uh, well, uh, Gorbachev is uh, part of Ukrainian origin, uh, and, and his wife, Raisa, whom he loved uh, dearly, uh, was actually Ukrainian. Uh, she lived in uh, Stavropol. She was born and lived in the region of Stavropol, uh, 
uh, where a lot of people were from the southern parts of the Soviet Union and from Ukraine. Uh, the principal language that was spoken in that part of the Stavropol region was a mixture of Russian and Ukrainian. So for Gorbachev, it was tragic that those two nations, those two republics that he regarded as extremely close and that indeed are extremely close ethnically, linguistically, and culturally, that they first divorced, and she accepted that, by the way. She accepted that. But then relations degenerated, deteriorated to the extent that it ultimately came to the uh, current uh, tragic situation. So I think that it, it's entirely clear what the source of his dismay was. For him, it was not just a political, but a personal thing. Uh, that, yeah, well, thank you for, for, for helping us understand that. Um, I want to come back to uh, the, the, the global nature of uh, perestroika and the end of the Cold War. Um, so in retrospect, Gorbachev often expressed uh, you know, a clear appreciation for the cooperativeness that was afforded him by Western leaders in, you know, during his time at the helm of the Soviet Union in ending uh, the Cold War. Uh, so the cooperativeness of uh, Reagan, Bush Sr. and Thatcher and others that, that you have mentioned. But he has also, since the 1990s, um, sometimes quite sharply criticized, criticized the West for what he saw as a kind of facile self-congratulation in the wake of the Soviet Union's collapse, uh, the, this uh, discourse of, about how the West won the Cold War, et cetera, et cetera. And in this context, Gorbachev has said, this is, this is a quote, in politics, Triumphalism gives bad advice, unquote. So I wonder if you could talk to us about uh, what Gorbachev felt was, has been so pernicious about Western triumphalism. And um, what did he think, what do you think uh, can the West learn from Gorbachev's admonitions? Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, Ambassador Matlock, who was the United States ambassador in the uh, Soviet Union, uh, from, I think, 1988 until uh, 1991, uh, uh, gave me uh, a note that President Reagan dictated uh, to his assistant uh, before going to Geneva for his first summit. It's a very interesting note because it contains both elements of Cold War thinking, and at the same time, it contains elements of new thinking. And in that note, Reagan said that if we succeed, we should not claim victory. That is a bad idea. We should regard this as common success. Well, unfortunately, that was not followed by the uh, American leaders after the breakup of the Soviet Union. The breakup of the Soviet Union, which happened for domestic internal reasons was regarded by Western leaders often openly in their public pronouncements as a victory in the Cold War. That really became for practically all US presidents after Reagan, a kind of slogan, we won the Cold War. Well, imagine how this was viewed in Russia, which, as you said, suffered tremendously because of the initially very unsuccessful economic reforms of the Yeltsin period, how this was regarded by Russians who were suffering from the consequences of the tremendous decline in the gross domestic product, when, in addition to that, they were told that they lost the Cold War. Whereas the end of the Cold War was a result of joint efforts. It was not all smooth sailing. And I, I do remember how many things happened that were extremely unfortunate, like spy scandals and, uh, uh, you know, uh, some maneuvers of uh, U.S. Navy ships in, in Soviet territorial waters. And all kinds of things happened. And it's the great merit of Gorbachev and Reagan that despite those 
uh, not just bumps on the road, but holes on the road, they were able to steer toward the end of the Cold War and the end of the nuclear arms race. But when it was over, you know, we were told that, well, this is it. This is it. We, we, the United States and the West, won the Cold War. And then NATO enlargement came. Of course, I, I do recognize that it is those countries of Central and Eastern Europe, like, like Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, that wanted to become members of NATO. That I really do not deny. But what I do think is that, of course, this process could have been played out very differently, could have been played out in a way that would also involve Russia in some kind of a partnership. But that did not happen. That did not happen. Uh, the, the enlargement of uh, NATO, which I believe was not a good idea in the first place, but it was handled in such a way that it became you know, a factor uh, undermining relations uh, at every point. So I think the lesson is that, well, of course, uh, countries have to put their national interests first, but they also have to bear in mind that other nations have their interests. And uh, when uh, the West today talks about a rules-based international order, an international order based on rules, I think that one of the first rules should actually be think not only about your own national interests, but also about the interests of others, because you are living on the same planet with those other countries, and uh, Russia is one of those countries. Yes, uh, yeah, thank you. That, that uh, uh, seems to channel a very, very Gorbachevian uh, spirit. So this is this is wonderful, and I would have many more questions, but uh, because I want to uh, obviously still leave time for uh, some uh, questions from uh, the audience. Let me close with with uh, with this question, uh, our part uh, of the uh, of the Q and A. So um, you've been you know very close to Gorbachev over so many years, not only as his uh, interpreter in those critical years, 85 to 91, but also afterwards, uh, not least in your work at the Gorbachev Foundation. And in many ways, you are an important steward of his uh, legacy. And uh, so what is what is your role and what's the role of the Gorbachev Foundation now that uh, Gorbachev has passed? And uh, so what's, what's your role today and in the years to come? Uh, well, uh, you use the word legacy. Yes, indeed. The legacy project is now the principal project of the Gorbachev Foundation, which means that we have to uh, be the stewards of his uh, archive. We have to um, bring all the Gorbachev's papers and documents into some kind of a system. We have to uh, publicize that. We believe that uh, a lot of his legacy is not known enough. We believe that something like a Gorbachev library is uh, an idea that uh, needs to be not just considered, but actually implemented. And we will be working both in Russia and internationally with uh, the presidential libraries of uh, the United States and other countries uh, to find new material that could be presented in this library. We also are planning to republish some of his books. For example, there's a very interesting books book that is called December 91, My Position. And it'll be republished this December and uh, we will have uh, the book launch of that a uh, book that contains the entire text of Gorbachev's book and also commentaries uh, by uh, prominent uh, experts and, and thinkers uh, who discuss the relevance of what Gorbachev wrote in 1992, the relevance of it today. So yes, there was a lot of work to be done. And uh, I do believe that uh, his uh, legacy will play a part in, 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 in a process which I hope will, will, will start fairly soon, in the process of normalizing uh, international relations and particularly relations between Russia and the West. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Polishchenko. I'll turn it over at this point uh, back to uh, Jonathan. Thank you, Mr. Polishchenko and Professor Link for that insightful Q&A. We will now transition to audience questions. In order to ask a question, please find the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. Also, make sure to upvote the questions you like. If you don't wish to ask the question with your own voice, you can ask the question anonymously. If you do wish to ask it with your own voice, we will let you unmute and you can ask your question. It's important to note that this event is being recorded and your questions may be uploaded to YouTube. With that, our first question is from Josh Paul. Can you comment on the relationship between Gorbachev and Bush 41? How did that contribute to the peaceful end of the Cold War? Uh, well, I would say that uh, the first uh, arms reduction agreement was, of course, between President Gorbachev and President Reagan. That's the INF Treaty, the Treaty on the Elimination of Intermediate Range Nuclear Missiles. But that concerned a relatively small part of the entire arsenal of nuclear weapons that uh, both nations had at that time. The uh, really big arms reductions and uh, uh, arms limitations were agreed by President Gorbachev and President Bush. So, uh, as I said, the first arms control and arms reduction agreement was on a relatively small portion of the arsenals. It was Bush and Gorbachev who signed the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty which I know President Reagan and Secretary of State Schultz wanted to sign on Reagan's watch, but unfortunately it didn't happen. And well, who can you blame? <laughs> uh, I don't know who to blame, but anyway, uh, ultimately it took uh, another three years to complete the work on that treaty. And the role of President Bush uh, was, I, I think, a very significant factor in finding solutions to the multiple problems and issues on the way to that uh, treaty. So uh, President Gorbachev uh, often spoke about the importance of the role of President Bush in uh, concluding and signing uh, that treaty and also in the process of ratifying that treaty, which was also, of course, uh, very important. Um, on the other hand, uh, uh, one can say that probably we could have expected more in terms of um, further developing other aspects of relations between the, uh, the Soviet Union and the U.S. following the end of the Cold War. On the other hand, again, one can say that, of course, the pace of international change at that time was so rapid that it probably was difficult to give enough attention to areas such as economic cooperation, for example, and various partnerships that could have started at that time. So, well, not all possibilities were uh, taken, some were missed, but overall, I think that the bush gorbachev period was a fruitful period in relations between the Soviet Union and the U.S. Thank you. Uh, next question comes from an anonymous attendee. So anonymous attendee asks, how did Gorbachev view the Western political system? Well, uh, Gorbachev uh, after the initial period where I think uh, she uh, believed during the first couple of years of perestroika that important change could be achieved by basically working within the Soviet system that she inherited. After that, she became, I think, a proponent, you can use that word, a proponent of political reform. And the political reform from the very start was moving in the direction of greater democracy, of freedoms, of rights. All of those ideas actually can be regarded as Western ideas. They are inherent in the Western political system. Democracy, the rule of law, human rights and freedoms, 
no one, I think, will say today or then that the system is perfect. But nevertheless, it's the system that contains all of those components. And it is those components that Gorbachev wanted to introduce and in many respects was successful in introducing in the Soviet Union. At the same time, he always made a point in his interviews, in his discussions with Western leaders, that every country's system is different, is special, and democracy is different in different countries. It's not the same system. Basically, you cannot say that there is a a Western system, a Western model that can be replicated in other countries. So he believed that uh, a Soviet system that will transition to democracy will have its specificities, will have its uniqueness, and uh, uh, she saw nothing bad about that. The important thing is that a system be democratic, that is to say that there be competitive elections and uh, uh, different political parties. All of those things Gorbachev recognized and, and believed in. Thank you. And for our last question, anonymous attendee asks, Can you speak to Gorbachev's views on Chernobyl? Did they evolve, and if so, how? Uh, Well, I wouldn't say that they evolved a lot, because uh, from the very start, she took the position that this was a a, a, a tragic disaster, that uh, the uh, country uh, had to do, the government and the entire nation had to do all that's possible and necessary to help the people who were victims of that disaster. She never tried to conceal the truth when she is blamed for not providing a lot of information during the first couple of days uh, of uh, that disaster. I I think that criticism is misplaced because, you know, what was happening was happening so rapidly that the information initially was just not available. They sent a team of leading Soviet scientists uh, led uh, by uh, academicians, members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences, uh, Dr. Belikov and Dr. Degasov and others, and it took them some time to understand what was happening. And uh, uh, when that became clear, well, the the entire uh, capacity, the entire potential, the entire strength of the uh, country was put to work to uh, grapple with the consequences of that disaster, to clean up, to evacuate those people that had to be evacuated, to help those people who needed medical help, and ultimately to uh, create a dome Uh, a huge dome over the entire, again, huge reactor that exploded. Uh, You know, when when, when people look for someone to blame, when people look for a scapegoat, well, they can assign blame on Gorbachev. But of course, you know, the the, uh, nuclear power plant accident is something that, that doesn't happen because, you know, the country's leader Uh, did something wrong. It it happened uh, because of a chain of mistakes, because of a chain of human errors made by people who uh, organized some kind of an experiment uh, at that uh, plant. And um, I would also say that uh, the uh, Soviet government uh, drew appropriate conclusions from what happened and that the safety and security of Soviet and then Russian uh, nuclear plants uh, has been uh, improved significantly over these years to make sure that they are no longer uh, a threat, that they no longer jeopardize uh, the people and actually the entire region where they are located. Uh, so, well, I, I wouldn't say that his initial position involved that much, but of course, 
subsequently, she received a lot more information than she had initially. All right, thank you. That concludes our event for this evening. I wish to thank again everyone for joining us this evening and thank Mr. Palashenko, Professor Link, Jessica Shroboga, our interim president, Dylan Griffith, our technical director, and our two ambassadors, Cooper Heidel and Alex Azar, for the work and time that went into this. To be in touch with the DPU, please use any of the links listed on the slide or join our group me. We hope to see you soon. Have a good night. Thank you.